if you look at the history of uh, physicians, uh, one of the people I definitely want to know or get to know, Dr. Charcot. So this is a classic scenario, 45-year-old female, and the uh, telltale is always the same. They've had a, this patient actually lived independently, if you can imagine that, a C5 quadriplegia, so a true Asia A, um, and she lived independently, which she shouldn't be able to do. So C7 is usually what I was taught. And she has dysautonomia. Fernando, what is dysautonomia? Can you use a microphone? It's an, an inability to control function of her autonomic nervous system. Like what? What are some of the clinical <laughs> manifestations? Well, like, dig like digestive, things like that, innervation of some of the uh, small, large intestines, for example. Um, yeah, Michelle. So, um, so anything above the major sympathetic trunk in the thoracolumbar region results in autonomic dysreflexia, which can uh, cause sudden episodes of hypertensive crisis in patients who have noxious stimuli below the level of their neurologic injury. I've seen, you know, bowel and bladder. I, the, the most strange case was a woman who had blood pressure of systolic 200, and we found one long hair wrapped around her great toe. So um, the strategy is to do a whole body survey looking for the noxious stimulus and eliminate that sit them up, nitropaste them. There, there are a number of different uh, strategies to try and prevent the hypertensive crisis. So th these are some of the absolute nuggets. And this is why it's so great to have our physiatrists uh, here also, uh, together with Dr. Tomsky and uh, Dr. Conico. Um, these patients have unstable blood pressures, but have these blood pressure crises. They can flush uh, weirdly. And you have to do a whole body survey. There are a couple of real nuggets in there. So these patients have to be literally stripped down. Classic problems are that they have uh, decubital ulcers or things like that. Uh, painful joints, infection somewhere. And so this was uh, meant for Peter Grunert, but he's so busy with call. Um, in our pre-op conference, we just showed this case and Dr. Hart asked him, who is on mini? And uh, on mini um, has many shapes and uh, colors and ages. But on mini is a classic radiographic finding. And when you see her, you just know it. And this is actually so much a radiographic nomenclature that they have an actual atlas called on mini's atlas of radiographic things. So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Oskuin, as a chief of the spine service, wants to buy an atlas of spine or create a spine atlas of on mini's diseases. But Charcot arthropathy is, oops, what's happening here? Oh, wow, we have an interruption. Oh, Dr. Litvak's favorite person, the hackers. Is that Jason again doing this? <clears throat> Happy birthday, Zach, in absentia. So again, with this patient, she's a C5 quad, and obviously this is a surgical talk, Michelle. But what would you do with a patient who has this kind of a thoracic lesion? Is this something that you wait and see? Obviously, you're going to say surgical consult, but w when you have this kind of a lesion mid-thoracic, what would you honestly usually do with this? Wait and see, biopsy it, brace the patient? So it largely depends on whether there's a functional element to it. If this patient is developing kyphotic posture and it's interfering with respiration or digestion, um, we sometimes think about bracing, but it tends to largely be unsuccessful. We don't want them to break down and cause additional injury, but at the same time, if it's an Asia A patient, they're not gonna have any further functional decline as far as their neurologic level of injury, um, but it's just concerning. You can still have, you know, structural damage, and at that point, you're right. We do. We reach out to our colleagues in our surgical world and ask for assistance. At the bottom, you actually see a sitting lateral. So this is something we like to do uh, sometimes in uh, neurologically impaired patients. Mm -hmm. so, she, so she does have a kyphosis there. Yeah. But yeah, so this is, this is something where there's a certain degree of therapeutic uncertainty because we just don't have a clear uh, mandate. And again, historically, um, what Michelle said is very true, uh, rings true with me. Um, most of these patients were observed because the general consensus was, does it matter? Why does it matter? So we did surgery on her because she had a significant loss of truncal balance and she's literally dislocated here. And again, you can argue, why does it matter? But for her, uh, with her un unstable uh, vital sign status, this was actually her noxious stimulus. Which brings me to the godfather of neurology um, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, Dr. Charcot. Jean-Martin Charcot is uh, truly probably one of the most influential people in modern day neurology. These are his um, uh, contributions that we know of to literature. And I'm still missing a column in your weekly mailings, Dave, on Jean-Martin Charcot. 
I mean, he should be like your godfather. He, pre, he predated so many of your writings and musings. It's amazing. And uh, obviously, the Charcot foot is, uh, is uh, one of the classic problems. But if you look at, for instance, this here, um, uh, this is a classic. And again, the Charcot arthropathy was something. And he's also the man, uh, Jean-Marie Charcot, who ended the railroad spine crisis. Do you know what the railroad spine crisis is, Dave? I do not, but he does look like Marlon Brando. Ah, OK. <laughs> That's not bad. I get that. The railroad spine was a classic case. Who knows what that is? Mark? Joel? The railroad spine was a classic case of mass hysteria. It's also known as Erickson's disease, where when railroads were introduced, there was actually a large body of literature that said that this concussive rapid speed, 20 to 40 miles per hour, would permanently damage the human spine. So there were actual class action lawsuits. Yes, back then, England, our system, our legal system is based upon the English system, as you know, the British system. There were class action lawsuits of the sufferers of railroad disease. There are medical experts who testified that a whole swath of patients were disabled chronically from pain and paralysis from these. Jean-Marty Charcot put an end to this, basically identified this as a histrionic conversion. Mind you, there was a confluence of physicians, practitioners, quacks, which is frequently combined, and lawyers, who basically all convoluted towards this mass hysteria. So Erickson's disease, railroad spine, Jean-Marie Charcot. And this is a great thing if you go to Paris. Uh, this is actually a picture, uh, not of mine, but uh, I have a very similar picture. Uh, the Hôpital de Salpetria is where uh, the largest neurologic hospital in the world is located, and this was where he practiced. And if you look at his students, Joseph Babinski, <coughs> Benet, Sigmund Freud, uh, uh, De La Tourette, I mean, he's really had an unbelievable legacy of uh, physicians. And this is, in a nutshell, what a Charcot arthropathy is about. Our cartilage, our bones, are sensitive structures. Yes, the neurosurgeons always try to think these are dumb structures, but they're actually living biofeedback machines. And again, um, basically, our proprioceptive system um, prevents this. This is a classic Charcot foot. This is something that um, Dr. Newell, Stan Newell, has treated many times together with Dr. Hansen at Harborview. Right, Stan? This is a classic Charcot foot, and it's amazing how often those are missed, right? In your field also. You usually seem pretty late. Um, so in the spine, this is also abbreviated as CSA Charcot spinal arthropathy, and it's an ant on minis disease. And again, there's a, a, a basic uh, thought process that you want to go through in terms of differential diagnosis, but it's a posterior column disease, uh, diabetic neuropathy, hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, spinal cord injury, syphilis, vitamin B12 deficiencies are all possible factors. And again, you want to think about uh, a number of other differential diagnoses as well. And it is a posterior column disease where basically the posterior column is denervated and doesn't work right. And this on the top right shows the ultimate culprit, the Golgi apparatus, the proprioceptive feedback cycle between tendons, joint capsules, and our posterior nerves is disrupted. And so this can lead to a mismatch. The real life problem for spinal cord injury patients, which is by far the largest population nowadays, is that they want to continue to live and we encourage them to go back to normal lives. And they have angers, they have passions, um, they have interests, they marry. Uh, they play sports. Here you see the U.S. Uh, yet again walloping Canada. Um, and again, they, they want to be active. So this is, uh, this is a big deal. One of the biggest challenges, and this I find is just uh, really a problem, is Canada is so far, since I made a mockery of Canada here, they're so far ahead of us in terms of having a regular spinal cord injury follow-up scheme. Throughout their provinces, it's provincially organized. All SCI patients have a routine follow program to look for arthropathies, to look for general health. We don't have that. One of the biggest problems that I found, and I'm uh, inviting Michelle to comment here, is transfers. We have seen in our Charcot patients unbelievable transfer problems that have just never been addressed and uh, identified by experts. Any do you care to comment on that, or do you just agree? Um, I agree, although um, outside of the spine, uh, we see more long-term health issues associated with chronic spinal cord injury, most notably um, your, your shoulder was never designed to be your hip, and they just get wear and tear on their shoulder joints, um, the, the neurogenic bowel and bladder, um, renal issues. I mean, there are a number of reasons why these patients need to have ongoing routine care by somebody in the primary care world or in the physiatry world who does spinal cord injury. Yeah. 
No, thanks. So, so transfers from a mechanical standpoint are a really big deal, but Michel uh, pointed out just after that a number of other things which uh, could be managed possibly with a checklist or close collaboration with primary care physicians. Obviously, you want to always think about a number of other factors around, especially the infection environment or non-unions um, or severe arthropathies. But the problem is that all other uh, um, kind of attempts at trying to treat these patients usually fail and are probably not uh, uh, helpful. Uh, the real problem is that we don't know the incidence of this disease. And this is, again, very frustrating. Just like Charcot arthropathies in the foot are not clearly ever a statistic have been assessed, we just don't have a very good idea uh, how often they happen. And so this is the problem. We have a neurologic injury. We don't know whether longer or shorter instrumentation or what level of neurologic injury actually is correlated with Charcot arthropathies. These are just all unknowns. And again, all statistics, like this one from the end of the 70s, is not quite clear. So it's rare, and for the largest part, basically we relied upon, until not too long ago, uh, case series. And um, again, the treatment was very inhomogeneous. Uh, questions of realignment, et cetera, were not clear. The world literature as of 2008 had 83 patients with 85 lesions published. So this is, again, how rare this is, and that people have a diagnostic and treatment uncertainty is not a particular question. Within two years, there were two articles. And again, these are relatively small numbers. But at Harborview, we published on 23 patients, usually 19 years following injury. Um, <clears throat> uh, and Again, uh, 28 patients were published out of Switzerland from our great competitors there, Nicholas Abley and New York Krebs uh, from Basel. And again, they had 28 patients um, that usually came 20 to 28 years uh, after their injuries. The presenting symptoms are all over the map. Progressive deformity, loss of sitting balance, autonomic dysreflexia, new ulcers, crepitus clicking, uh, meningitis, weird pains, uh, unexplained anemia from erosion of arteries, Progressive ascending neuro deficits. I had a patient who became a quadriplegic after having a T12 lesion. He had an ascending cyst that basically tracked up his cord. And death. We've had patients who came basically dead from eroded uh, segmental arteries that came to an ER and nobody knew what was going on. They had a thoracic Charcot arthropathy. So again, the time of onset is usually delayed over 10 years after surgeries, 17 years average based upon what we could identify. Uh, the longer rod fixations have been implicated, but are still not very clear. We've tried to sort that out. But in principle, restoration of sitting balance with shorter fixation is what we nowadays uh, recommend. But a lot of higher up paraplegics do like the sitting balance from longer rods. So we just have to be aware uh, that longer rods have their benefits also. Getting sitting x-rays, I think, is very important. And CT scans are more helpful than MRIs. What is not helpful are needle aspirates, biopsies, or doing flap coverages. Several of my Charcot patients that came to me have had multiple flap coverages because their fluid cyst basically breaks through their skin. So that's, again, not the problem. The problem is that the spine is unstable. And again, for us, the uh, radiographic hallmarks here, I entered Dr. Susanto's territory, is this con uh, a combination of amorphous hyperostosis, uh, regional osteolysis, massive hypertrophy, and loss of alignment. And that's very similar to the Charcot arthropathy in the foot. These are some of the outcomes comparing the Harborview series on the left and the uh, Swiss series. So delay in care of over a year was found in a third of our patients. So they basically had all sorts of treatment. We had some patients with over 20 biopsies and antibiotics and portacaths and braces. We only found concurrent infection 17 patients. Uh, the Swiss did not really look at that. Um, the, the Swiss had several patients non-operatively treated that died within a year from sepsis, interestingly, uh, but that's systemic sepsis, and they had a surgical death also within a day. We did not have any surgical deaths in our series. The treatment principles I think we all concur on is an interlesional debridement. If there's frank pus, we put antibiotic beads, which you see on the top right, so a combination of PMMA that we literally mix with antibiotic powder that is heat-stable in there. Um, these can be very bloody procedures. We strongly recommend against anterior procedures because uh, the anatomy is very distorted and very difficult to get to. And we recommend an anterior posterior reconstruction. We try to preserve the cord for psychological function, but also if patients have some form of spasticity, a lot of paraplegics or quadriplegics like having some spasticity. And we usually fuse to the uh, pelvis. And more recently, we've used four-rod constructs, which was the purpose of our study. 
um, at Harborview in 2012. Uh, one com uh, common problem was seen here on the left side. We would fix these patients very nice, and then their rods would break apart. And uh, we then, basically out of need, developed in, uh, over the years this quadruple rod construct. So we had two series from Harborview, Paul Anderson and Dinah Cardenas, a famous uh, physiatrist at Harborview. She's now in Miami, part of the Miami Project, published uh, a series of uh, um, uh, nine cases between 85 and 92. And again, their revision rate was 100%. So they basically were very frustrated. Uh, our 28 cases uh, from 98 to 2008 had a revision rate of 15%, and we attributed that towards these quadruple rods. So this is a case in point. So this is a uh, T9 Asia A patient, and we basically reconstructed him in a staged fashion with a quadruple rod construct, and he actually did very well. And these are intimidating constructs, uh, and again, what we don't know is whether they actually heal, but again, for Daniel and his colleagues, these are intimidating looking x-rays, um, but we try to not brace these patients and get them up as soon as possible. Um, so this is another classic problem that we're seeing missed more and more uh, are these sacral injuries because conventional x-rays are usually not obtained and these patients can literally erode, this patient eroded two or three lumbar vertebrae and eroded his pelvis uh, as he was going on and these pelvic reconstructions can be quite challenging uh, to treat. So the conclusion of this is, uh, again, uh, Jean-Martin Charcot was a true visionary. He really was well ahead of his time, and he's had a lasting impact um, on, uh, I think, so many neurologic conditions, but also our understanding of the in intricacies of the interactions of the musculoskeletal system and the brain, which is very necessary. Um, uh, we have to identify and know of Charcot arthropathies, and this is, again, an interdisciplinary education. We have to, I think, treat them personally. And again, uh, there's no comparison statistic uh, in terms of when we can treat these non-operatively and what immobilization can do. I share Michelle's observation. They don't heal if you put them into braces, even the mid-thoracic ones. And we have to teach uh, the importance of understanding how our musculoskeletal system works. And this is a true outcome story. This patient here is Joe Gaskins. He gives me permission to use his name. He's the president of the American Spinal Injury Association. And this was his pelvis here. And he was treated with about four plastic surgeries. And I was called by a plastic surgeon and who was frustrated that uh, there was fluid leaking out of his flaps, despite having had several gluteal flaps done. He had a Charcot arthropathy that had been missed. Um, and he had actual CSF pouring out of him. He had meningitis and a number of problems. And he was so grateful for this. Uh, Sue is not here. But he had my youngest daughter, who never got to be a flower girl, be his flower girl for his wedding. So he's a great guy, and he's very happy. I find that a really good outcome study. So happy birthday, Zach, or wherever you are today. I hope it's going to be huge. And thank you all.